Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dearman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. 1 Peter chapter 3, and here's what it says. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. That's a powerful truth right there. And speaking to wives, including wives who are married to an unbelieving man. So it says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Let me tell you, that's not easy to do with human beings. And some of you know us husbands, we are just pretty self-centered and uh, pretty difficult to work with. And yet the Bible is saying, wives, I want to teach you something. I want to show you something. Be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word of God. I mean, this is one of the most difficult things. You got a husband, uh, and of course, it can be reversed as well. But you have a husband who just doesn't buy it. Maybe even an atheist, an outspoken atheist, an angry atheist, right? That it says that they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. In other words, we can so impact other people, even without getting on their cases, even without trying to influence them orally, but by our conduct, it can be impactful. It can be, it can be deafening how loud our conduct in the Lord can be. And he's saying, wives, this is so powerful. If you will be Christ-like, with your husbands. Even unbelieving husbands can be won. Now, notice it says, even if some do obey, they without a word may be won. It doesn't say they'll all be won. Why? Because God still gives them a choice. He's not going to force them because they're married to a believer. But let me tell you, the power of the conduct, the power of the the love and the faith. It requires faith to do this, let me tell you. You have to believe God, and you have to love the Lord to be able to do it. But he talks about the great impact that just our conduct, a godly conduct, can have on other people, including a spouse. And this goes both ways. Husbands, if you're married to uh, somebody and uh, whether they're a believer or not, we need to love them, uh, love that lady like Christ loves the church. But even if they don't know the Lord, even if they're an outright, outspoken, angry atheist, okay, then still the way that you love, the way that you humble yourself, the way that you lay your life down to bless and love them, oh, it's impactful. And so we can win our spouses. And of course, that applies to other people as well. Verse two, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. That doesn't mean you're cowering. I'm afraid of you. It's talking about your reverence, your respect, the way that you show respect. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment, talking to ladies still, do not let your adornment be merely outward. Don't let, you know, you uh, presenting yourself just be how you present yourself on the outside. Arranging the hair, wearing gold, or, uh, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So he's saying, ladies, Look, don't just make yourself look good on the outside because ladies have a tendency, of course, to love to shop or love to, to dress themselves correctly. And there's nothing wrong with that. He's not saying dress like a slob and look, look uh, homely or unbecoming. He's saying, but you women of God, don't let your beauty 
be primarily outward. Let what's inside come out. So, of course, what's inside can also be presented on the outside with how you dress and so on. But you wouldn't want it to be provocative. You wouldn't want it to be sensual. You wouldn't want it to be something that attracts people and makes them think the wrong thoughts because that's not godly. He said, no, let your beauty be something that comes primarily from the inside. He said, Verse 4, rather, rather than just the outside, let it be the hidden person of the heart. Now, I just want to comment on that, the hidden person of the heart. What does that mean? Well, uh, it's easy to find a, a part of your heart. Your heart, spiritually, has two chambers. And I'm not talking about your blood pump. I'm talking about the inside of you has two parts to it, your spirit and your soul. And the soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. But when you get born again, there's a, that one chamber, that spirit, you, you get saved. But you've got this other side. And so he says, look, women, godly women, let the beauty that you show to other people be that hidden person of the heart. See, your psychological side, your soulish side, That's easy for people to see. You can go to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and they can ask you questions and test you and so on, and they can see your soul. But the Bible says uh, you cannot discern the spirit like that. The spirit has to be spiritually discerned. See, and so that's the hidden person of the heart. That's why you have psychologists and psychiatrists, but where are the spiritologists? Or, if we want to get the Greek word, the pneumatologist, right? Well, there, you know, there's some that work with the lungs, but not the spirit. See, and so we know what the spirit is like by the word of God. The word of God explains the human spirit, both dead before being born again and alive after being born again. But notice here it, it describes the spirit as the hidden person of the heart. The spirit, the soul are in your heart, see, but the hidden person of the heart is your spirit. He said, let your beauty be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. You don't want to be just a loud, we're not talking about personality. We're talking about a gentle and quiet spirit. There's something about the godliness of a person, and this he's talking about a woman, but this is everybody, that limits what you say, what you do, how strongly you respond, how freely you speak your mind and such. And so he's talking to a lady and saying, let your beauty come from that spirit inside, that gentle, quiet spirit inside that doesn't just have to speak its mind all the time and retaliate and and defend yourself and criticize and all of that. He's saying, no, let that born again side of you come out. And he said that born again side of you is the most beautiful side. And let that be your beauty. Verse five, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. He's saying this is like those of old, including Sarah, who honored Abraham, called him Lord, not Lord like uh, he's God, or a God, no, but honoring him as uh, the head of the family and such, and speaking respectfully, as that's probably the way that we would say today, treating and speaking of your spouse, your husband, in a very respectful way. And Peter's saying, oh, there's something beautiful when that happens. Let me tell you again, it requires faith, and it requires uh, uh, love, for God and a trust in God that you're not losing out in this process, but you're doing what's something that pleases God and it actually impacts people in a wonderful way. So it goes on to say, uh, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good. So you are Sarah's daughters. You are, uh, children of Abraham through the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're willing to do this, if you're willing to have this kind of kingdom 
conduct. And I believe we are. Husbands, now we're going to get on the husbands. Likewise, dwell with them, your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife. And you know, a lot of husbands, they they just don't get their wives because their wives tend to have more emotions and uh, more complexity to their feelings and the things that are going on in their hearts and minds. And sometimes husbands don't feel like they're as rational. That's not necessarily the case, but I'm just saying sometimes they feel like that. They're not as rational or not as logical. And this says, husbands, dwell with them with understanding. We can't just say, well, they don't make sense. Oh, well, I don't. they're not thinking logically. They're emotional. No, but a godly husband, Peter says, needs to dwell with him with understanding. Honey, I want to understand what you feel. I may not get it right now, but explain it to me again. I want to, I want to know this. I love you. I care about you. Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. That just means that ladies are not as physically muscular and strong as men. This is just a, something biological. And it goes on to say, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So in other words, even though they physically may not have the muscles and the strength that you as a man have, he said, they're still heirs together. (laughs) Oh, when, when your wife is born again and you're born again, let me tell you, there is no, uh, There is no one that has a greater inheritance in the Lord. There's no bond or free. Galatians says there's no male or female. Man, when when you get born again, you're a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have all the inheritance of the Lord. And when you get filled with the Spirit, you have all the powerful Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not minimized in a woman uh, less than a man. The Holy Spirit is not minimized in a young person or a child less than a man. Uh, an adult. No, the Holy Spirit is not minimized in one culture and maximized in another. No, everybody's the same. You get born again, you get spirit filled, these maximum powers and the inheritance comes to you. And he said, husbands, you need to understand this, that they are heirs together with you. Your wife is an heir together with you of the grace of life. Notice this, that your prayers may not be hindered. Hindered, Husbands, if you don't seek to understand your wives and to partner with them and unify with them, then your prayers will be hindered because you're walking in disunity with someone who is an heir of salvation. So uh, I tell you, <laughs> Peter doesn't let husbands off the hook at all. And we know he's a husband because Jesus healed Peter's wife's mother. So notice this. Finally, verse 8, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted, courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit uh, in it, excuse me, that you may inherit a blessing. So notice, Peter, this is not rough, uh, spout off, say whatever you want to, Peter, that a lot of people say he is. Uh Uh-uh. No, this is a Peter saying that says, don't revile for reviling. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate on people. Don't be defensive and defend yourself. But the opposite, be courteous, be loving, be compassionate with one another. And he goes on to say, verse 10, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And of course, he's quoting from the Old Testament and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So Peter is advocating for us being loving, being compassionate and not retaliating on people. Verse 13, and he, excuse me, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. So he's saying, look, if you're not speaking evil and harming other people, you're not going to have people coming at you very often. He said, but verse 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. You need to know that if 
if you're being retaliated on for doing good and not for doing evil, he said, you need to know you're blessed. You're going to get rewarded for that. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. He's saying, when people are asking you, why do you believe what you believe and such? He said, always be ready to give a defense. That doesn't mean to be defensive, but be ready to explain to them why you believe what you believe about the Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life. Verse 16, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. In other words, live in such a way that if people attack and criticize you, once they look at your lifestyle, then those who attacked you will be ashamed because it's evident to everybody. Man, I'm attacking somebody who lives a very humble, peaceable life. They're not trying to hurt anybody. They're doing good. And so the accuser will be ashamed. Verse 17, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer. Let me read it again. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. I'm going to come back to that. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So let me just come back to this very interesting little part here in verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom, by whom also he went, by whom, Jesus, by the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once in the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight souls were saved so Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. Well, do you remember the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that Jesus, he said, the one who ascended also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He preached to the spirits in prison. And so Jesus Uh, Having been resurrected, he needed to lead captivity captive. In You remember the 16th chapter of Luke, Jesus tells this story about the rich man and Lazarus that both Lazarus that both die, and the rich man found himself in torments, in flames, in Hades, but across a big gulf, Lazarus found himself in a place with other people, with Abraham, in Abraham's bosom. It's in the same cavern of the earth down below, inside the earth, but there was a gulf fix between them. Well, Jesus had to go after the resurrection, after the price was paid, the blood was sprinkled on the heavenly tabernacle, and he led these people that had been waiting for the Messiah, waiting for the salvation, he led them up to heaven. So now there's nobody in Abraham's bosom in terms of Hades, this cavern here, but they're all in heaven. To be absent from the body now is to be present with the Lord. But these other people who were disobedient and such all the way back to the days of Noah and all of that, they also received the preaching, but it was too late for them to repent and to be saved. Some people believe this also refers to those spirits that were here, or excuse me, uh, the angels who sinned uh, that the Bible talks about and the sons of God coming to the daughters of men in the sixth chapter of Genesis that we won't get into at this point. But the Bible says they've been chained, put into chains until the end judgment at the end of days. So you can see Peter knows some things just beyond what he saw with his eyes. He sees into these things spiritually so much 
And uh, Paul was able to help bring a lot more light even to Peter because Paul received these things so accurately in the Spirit. All right, that's chapter 3 of 1 Peter. We could say much more, but I think that's good for today. I look forward to being with you chapter 4. Thank you again for watching today. If you haven't already done it, click the like button and share this video with others to help them get into God's Word. Also, we'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God. To find out more about our BFAM strategy, our ministry school, the BFAM Training Center, other great teaching resources, or to launch a house church, visit solidlives.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow.